Well, good morning, and thank you for being here. I'm Rod Rosenstein, Deputy Attorney General, joined this morning by the Acting DEA Administrator, Robert Patterson, the Acting ICE Deputy Director, Peter Edge, Assistant Commissioner Joanne Crampton of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We also have our Acting Assistant Attorney General of the Criminal Division, Kenneth Blanco, U.S. Attorney Michael Hurst from Southern Mississippi, U.S. Attorney Christopher Myers from the District of North Dakota, U.S. Attorney Billy Williams from the District of Oregon, and ICE Special Agent in Charge Alex Koo uh, from St. Paul. I want to thank you all for being here. Today we are pleased to announce two indictments that mark a major milestone in our battle to stop deadly fentanyl from entering the United States. For the first time, we have indicted major Chinese fentanyl traffickers who have been using the Internet to transport fentanyl and fentanyl analogs to drug traffickers and to individual customers in the United States. These cases reflect a new and disturbing trend, a part of the opioid crisis that we face here in the United States. More and more of our citizens are being killed by fentanyl. These are synthetic opioids that are much stronger and much more dangerous than heroin. A few grains of fentanyl can be a lethal dose. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that more than 20,000 American citizens lost their lives in 2016 due to fentanyl. That's 20,000 of the total of approximately 64,000 Americans who are estimated to have died of drug overdoses in 2016. And that number is rising at a dramatic rate. Fentanyl and fentanyl analogs are coming into the country in numerous ways, including shipments from factories in China directly to U.S. customers who make those purchases over the Internet. The President and the Attorney General have made it a priority for us to combat this opioid crisis. The Department of Justice is playing a leading role in those efforts. In July, we announced charges of more than 120 individual defendants for their roles in prescribing and distributing opioids and other dangerous narcotics. We also announced the takedown of the largest marketplace on the dark web where fentanyl and other deadly drugs were sold. We created an opioid fraud and detection task force to pursue opioid-related health care fraud, and we are better aligning our resources and our training to better target and prosecute opioid-related crimes. We recently announced grants of $58.8 million to combat the opioid epidemic. And these are just a few of the ways that our department is making it a priority to combat opioid drugs. Today, we are announcing that two Chinese nationals have been indicted by grand juries in two separate cases, the first in the district of Southern District of Mississippi and the second in the District of North Dakota. These defendants allegedly were engaged in conspiracies to distribute large quantities of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in the United States. And I caution you, these are allegations. Uh, the defendants uh, remain presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty in court. These are the first two Chinese-based defendants designated as what we call Consolidated Priority Organizational Targets, or CPOTs, by U.S. law enforcement, the first two to be charged for violations of U.S. law. The first case began with a traffic stop in Mississippi in 2013 that unearthed a domestic drug ring selling synthetic drugs, which were known as spice or bath salts. They were delivering these products by commercial parcel delivery services. Now, during the investigation that followed, the federal investigators identified Xiao Bing Yan, a distributor of a multitude of illegal drugs, including synthetic cathinones and cannabinoids, as well as synthetic opioids. Using different company names and identities over a period of at least six years, Mr. Yan operated websites advertising and selling acetylfentanyl and other deadly fentanyl derivatives directly to U.S. customers across the country. Investigators also determined that Yan operated at least two chemical plants in China. They were capable of producing quantities of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs of tons at a time. Yan monitored legislation and law enforcement activities in the U.S. and China, and he was able to modify the chemical structure of fentanyl. That's one of the key challenges we face here, is that these chemists are able to make subtle changes in the molecular structure of the fentanyl drugs in order to stay a step ahead of law enforcement efforts to schedule and prohibit the production and distribution of these substances. Over the course of the investigation, agents identified more than 100 distributors of synthetic opioids, 
involved with Jan's manufacturing and distribution networks. They intercepted packages that were mailed from Jan's internet pharmacy companies. We seized multiple kilograms of suspected acetyl fentanyl, which would be enough for thousands of doses. Yan was indicted in the Southern District of Mississippi on September 7th on two counts of conspiracy to manufacture and distribute controlled substances and seven counts of actually manufacturing and distributing the drugs in specific instances. The second case began in January of 2015 when law enforcement agents in Grand Forks, North Dakota responded to the tragic fentanyl overdose death of an 18-year-old. Agents were able to identify another resident as the source of the fentanyl that caused that death. They then uh, found that they were using cryptocurrency known as Bitcoin to buy fentanyl, heroin, and other drugs over the internet using encrypted websites on the dark net. The agents and prosecutors traced the source of those illegal drugs back to China. Uh, they found that they had gone through Oregon and Canada and it had originated with a man named John Zhang in China. They learned that Zhang ran the organization that manufactured fentanyl uh, in at least four different labs in China and that he advertised and sold the fentanyl to U.S. customers over the internet. His organization would send the orders of fentanyl and other illicit drugs and pill presses, stamps and dyes, which were actually used to stamp the fentanyl powder into pills. They sent those to customers throughout the United States using the mail and parcel delivery services. Agents determined that Jang sent many thousands of those packages since January of 2013. Now, Jang and eight other individuals were indicted in the District of North Dakota on September 20th of 2017. And according to that indictment, there was a conspiracy to distribute fentanyl and fentanyl analogs in at least 11 states between January 2013 and August 2016, and a conspiracy to import the drugs to the United States from Canada and China. This was a money laundering conspiracy, an international a drug conspiracy, and a continuing criminal enterprise, according to the allegations in the indictment. Now, fentanyl is sold in many forms in the United States, all of which are potentially deadly. It can be purchased as pure fentanyl, fentanyl mixed with heroin, cocaine, and even marijuana, and it sometimes is pressed into pill form and falsely sold and misrepresented as a prescription opioid drug. Users often have no idea about what they're getting. They don't know about the purity. They don't have any idea what's in the pills, and that's one of the reasons why it proves to be so deadly. Chinese fentanyl distributors are using the Internet to distribute fentanyl directly to U.S. customers. Uh, in many cases, they're using multiple identities to conceal their true location and obscure the trail of profits going back to China. They take advantage of the fact that the fentanyl molecule can be altered in numerous ways to create an analog that's not listed as illegal under U.S. or Chinese law. When regulators are able to identify the new fentanyl and make it illegal, the distributors quickly switch to a new unlisted fentanyl analog. So we are working very closely with our Chinese colleagues and other countries to stem the flow of illicit fentanyl into the United States. We're moving aggressively to investigate and prosecute suppliers of this poison to U.S. citizens. Both cases that we are announcing today uh, resulted from coordinated multi-agency, multinational investigations conducted by agents and investigators with the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. They were supported by national and international coordination led by our multi-agency special operations division. Uh, our Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, or OCDF unit, represents a partnership of federal, state, and local law enforcement, which works very closely with international organizations to disrupt and dismantle drug suppliers. I particularly want to commend the DEA, Homeland Security Investigations, IRS, Criminal Investigation Division, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police for their incredible investigative work, as well as our own criminal division and our U.S. Attorney's Offices for Southern Mississippi, North Dakota, and Oregon. In addition, we had support from the Quebec Office of the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, and we did receive valuable assistance from the Ministry for Public Security in China, and we want to thank them for their help. Our dedicated investigators and prosecutors working in partnership with our international partners are committed to shutting down this deadly traffic in opioid drugs and particularly in illicit fentanyl and saving the lives of our citizens. Uh, we're going to hear from Mr. Patterson, Mr. Edge, 
uh, and Assistant Commissioner Crampton, and then we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you and good morning. I'm honored here to be here representing the men and women of the Drug Enforcement Administration. I'm incredibly proud of this same group of employees for their work every day on both addressing the diversion of licit opioids and the pursuit of those involved with the illicit manufacture and distribution of opioids, the reason why we're here to speak today. DEA's contributions to the two cases discussed today are the result of efforts initiated over Miami and New Orleans divisions. As these cases expanded, work by DEA investigators across this country and overseas in conjunction with our federal, state, and international partners produced today's results. The indictment of Chinese nationals, Yan and Zhang. Yan and Zhang have been exposed for who they are. The arrest efforts against several of their significant U.S. and Canada-based facilitators have already been successfully coordinated. At a time when overdose deaths are at catastrophic levels, let me be clear, DEA's top priority, not one of them, but top priority is addressing opioids and pursuing criminal organizations distributing their poison to American neighborhoods. Yan and Zhang and their criminal associates represent one of the most significant drug threats facing our country. Overseas organized crime groups capable of producing nearly any synthetic drug imaginable to include fentanyl and who attempt to hide their international shipments by using web-based sales and cryptocurrency transactions. As discussed during the recent announcements of the shutdown of Alpha Bay and Hansen Networks, technology, particularly the Internet, helps criminal hide, criminals hide their true identity. Encryption, the dark web, anonymizing software, and online markets all pose significant challenges to law enforcement. Modern logistics also make it possible for criminals to complete massive numbers of smaller illicit transactions, which are harder to identify and interdict. However, as demonstrated by the cha charges announced today, investigators around the globe work with precision and sophistication to thwart their efforts. It's also important to acknowledge our relationship with the government of China and specifically the Ministry of Public Security, as just mentioned. DEA's Beijing office continues to enjoy a strong and healthy relationship with the MPS. Building on that relationship, earlier this year, DEA officials traveled to China to discuss these critical matters with their leadership, and the Chinese have been, resp have been responsive. As law enforcement, we remain steadfast and aggressively targeting criminal organizations that perpetuate the epidemic. Both the issue of opioid, or but the issue of opioid abuse is both complex and requires the collective efforts of not just law enforcement, but also of families, communities, educators, health care, and treatment organizations. The Deputy Attorney General just noted the preliminary 2016 CDC statistics show synthetic opioids are the leading driver of overdose deaths in the United States. In addition, the same data estimates more than 64,000 Americans died as a result of drug overdoses in 2016. My fear is that the American public has a general awareness of this problem, which comes from a number, a statistic, that most struggle to comprehend, which they should. I challenge all of us to look beyond the statistic and instead focus on the individuals behind those numbers. Part of the solution related to this unnecessary loss of lives has to come from discussions, which can be difficult and uncomfortable. Each one of these deaths impacts real people, from the immediate victim to all those whose lives they touched. We have a shared responsibility to educate the public by making sure the message is clear. The path of opioid abuse, once taken, all too often ends in tragedy. We cannot continue on this path. In an attempt to be efficient with your time, I would simply add my appreciation to the group that the Deputy Attorney General just acknowledged. The tireless efforts of these individuals are the reason why we're here today, and their work makes this nation safer. I'm now pleased to introduce a friend and a critical partner to DEA, ICE Acting Deputy Director Peter Edge. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today to discuss a great investigative effort both on our domestic front as well as with our foreign counterparts. On September 20th, nine subjects were federally indicted in the District of North Dakota for possession with intent to distribute controlled substances, namely heroin and fentanyl. 
a drug that is 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times more potent than morphine has become a menace to our communities across our nation and around the world. This investigation has resulted in 21 criminal arrests, 20 convictions, along with the seizure of fentanyl with a street value of more than $1 million. This case began in July, uh, January of 2015 when the Grand Forks, North Dakota Police Department responded to what has become an all too familiar tra tragedy in the United States, the her heroin and fentanyl overdose of two young adults. Only one of them survived. These overdose deaths are attributed to criminal activity by drug trafficking organizations. This investigation by the Grand Forks Narcotics Task Force identified a local source of supply for the heroin and fentanyl powder as a 19-year-old local resident was also identified from Portland, Oregon as a main supplier of this organization. As an organized crime drug enforcement task force investigation, the investigation was worked jointly with all of our local and federal partners. The Drug Enforcement Administration, U.S. Postal Inspection Service, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the Internal Revenue Service, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Fargo, Portland, Oregon, Fort Lauderdale, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Montreal. Without the connectivity of all those law enforcement organizations, we would certainly be at a loss. Cooperation is critical to our success. Through ongoing investigations, interviews, and evidence collection, it was determined that a subject in China, Zhen Zhang, was using international mail parcels to supply the organization in Canada. Co-conspirators in Canada communicated with U.S. networks via encrypted communications and the drugs were distributed nationally, regionally, and locally through the mail or hand-to-hand -hand transactions. Most recently, two of the indicted defendants, Anthony Gomes and Elizabeth Tun, were arrested in Davie, Florida, where a search of their residence resulted in the seizure of approximately $175,000 in U.S. currency, a Maserati, and two firearms. I would like to recognize the exceptional work of our Homeland Security Investigation Special Agents, Jeremy Group, Guy Gino, Alexis Gregory, as well as the North Dakota U.S. Attorney, Chris Myers, for their tireless efforts, their commitment to seeking justice, and their dedication to the safety and security of American people. I would also like to recognize the incredible teamwork and collaboration enjoyed by HSI and the DEA offices in Grand Forks, Portland, Miami, West Palm Beach, as well as the HSI and DEA attaches covering Canada, Panama, Colombia, and China. This investigation exemplifies the steadfast commitment by ICE HSI to combat the flow of dangerous and illegal drugs into our nation. In 2016, HSI seized 6,000 pounds of heroin, more than 500 pounds of fentanyl, 46,000 pounds of methamphetamines, and 270,000 pounds of cocaine. All of this along with the seizure of nearly a half a billion dollars in U.S. currency and other assets. Collaboration has resulted in great results. Thank you very much for your time today. Good morning. I am honored to be here representing the Royal Canadian Mounted Police on this day. I'm Assistant Commissioner Joanne Crampton, Officer in Charge of Federal Policing and Criminal Operations. The RCMP continually strives to work with international law enforcement partners in order to combat transnational organized crime and crime groups that are engaged in illicit activities. In this instance, the RCMP worked in collaboration with ICE and the DEA to target a drug network that was distributing synthetic drugs internationally. The results of that collaboration are evident today with this major announcement. Synthetic drugs, and in particular fentanyl, are a major threat to both of our countries. As law enforcement agencies, it's our duty to combat this in every possible way. 
Law enforcement partnerships are critical to successfully pursue those who are fueling this public health crisis. Fentanyl trafficking is a worldwide problem. It clearly knows no borders, and we need to intercept drugs before they reach our communities. Police are routinely faced with challenges related to illicit co commodities, and as such, we're continually adapting our operations by developing new training, policies, and procedures to deal with these ongoing and evolving threats in our communities. The RCMP has implemented a national investigative strategy to target fentanyl, importers, distributors, manufacturers, and traffickers. This has resulted in the disruption and dismantling of criminal groups. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police are willing partners in the continued efforts and collaboration with the United States and international law enforcement in the disruption of transnational organized crime. I thank you for your time today. Thank you. We'd be happy to take any questions. Yes, sir. Mr. Rosenstein, you and several of you have mentioned the cooperation from China. So beyond the indictments, can you tell us whether there have been any arrests of these individuals, whether their labs have been shut down, whether their websites have been shut down? No, what I can tell you is that uh, I was in China two weeks ago and held a series of meetings, including with the Minister of Public Security, uh, Minister Guo, and uh, I emphasized to all of the Chinese officials that I met that we appreciate their support. They are, in fact, uh, helping us, but we need them to do more. We need them to do more because 20,000 American citizens lost their lives in 2016, and many tens of thousands more were injured as a result of fentanyl manufactured in China, distributed from China to the United States. Uh, and so uh, we appreciate their support, uh, but we're asking them to do more. We're asking them to help us uh, by enforcing the existing laws. We're asking them to continue to schedule fentanyl derivatives, and we've also asked them to schedule fentanyl precursors. Fentanyl is produced by precursor chemicals, uh, and there have been international controls imposed on those precursors. Uh, but we believe that uh, most, if not all, fentanyl that's distributed here in the U.S. and in Canada originates in China, either manufactured there or manufactured with precursor chemicals that come from China. Uh, and so uh, we're seeking additional support uh, from the Chinese government in cracking down on those labs uh, and making sure that uh, uh, they take this issue as seriously as we do. I know if it were the other way around, if uh, tens of thousands of Chinese nationals were dying as a result of poison shipped from the United States, uh, we'd be very proactive. And so we're hoping to get the same kind of response from them. So with regard to these particular defendants, we have no extradition treaty with China, uh, but we are optimistic and hopeful that the Chinese will take appropriate action to make sure that they're held accountable. Yes, ma'am. So historically, the Chinese haven't always been very cooperative. For example, several years ago, there was the indictment of several high-profile um, government-related hackers, and we were continuously promised by the previous administration that those individuals would be detained eventually and perhaps extradited to the United States, and that never happened. So to be clear, you have no assurances that the Chinese Chinese government will cooperate in this case. I mentioned I was there two weeks ago. We had Chinese representatives here uh, in the United States last week. We met with the Attorney General and State Department officials, and uh, we talked with them about hacking uh, as well as uh, about fentanyl. These are obviously different issues. Uh, with regard to the fentanyl issue, though, as I told you, I believe that we have a commitment from the Chinese to continue to support our efforts. Do you know if these two are even in custody? Uh, I'm not going to comment on the enforcement work in China. What I can tell you is that we've been in communication with Chinese officials, and we are going to share with them the evidence that we've gathered, and then we'll see what action they take. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Rosenstein, these, uh, these indictments obviously target traffickers overseas, but I'm curious about what's being done right here in this country. Obviously, in the wake of the 60 Minutes report, the Washington Post report over the weekend, there was a memo obtained by both organizations that said that the DOJ had uh, issued suspensions for <coughs> only six either doctors or distributors or pharmacies this year as opposed to 65 in 2011. So obviously there's an effort overseas, but what's happening here at home? I'm going to let Rob Patterson talk about that. You're talking about DEA administrative authority. Just to clarify, you know, this the fentanyl that we're talking about here is illegal. It's not it's not a diversion of a lawfully prescribed drug. This is illegal. It's illegal in the manufacture and distribution uh, to the United States. Uh, the issue addressed in the 60 Minutes uh, piece and in the Post story uh, is about the diversion of legitimate pharmaceutical drugs for illegitimate purposes. That's an issue that uh, uh, is a priority for us. I can tell you I have some personal experience with that. When I was U.S. Attorney in Maryland, we handled a series of civil enforcement actions. Uh, and the civil enforcement actions all are originated from DEA against pharmaceutical companies and pharmacies for Controlled Substance Act violations. Uh, we had a series of cases, including 
uh, McKesson and Cardinal Health, as well as a number of smaller distributors. Uh, so I'm going to let Mr. Patterson, as I said, speak to that, but I can tell you that uh, I've talked with him. He's only been in the job as acting administrator about a week or two, uh, but he understands that this is uh, our top priority. So again, to, to go over what he just spoke about, uh, we're talking about the diversion of licit manufactured uh, products in the United States. So I think Look, although the 60 Minutes piece uh, pointed out some concerns that we should all share, uh, I'd also like to, to point out a couple things that I don't believe were, were probably expanded on to the extent that they should have been. And, and one of the key ones is ultimately what that legislation did in terms of our orders, or I should say uh, our immediate suspension orders. So the, the piece both in the, in the Times, uh, I'm sorry, not in the Times, but in the Post and with 60 Minutes, uh, discussed our use of our administrative actions against manufacturers and distributors. It, it, to be clear with everybody, when we talk about the 65 administrative actions in the years in the past, that included not just those two categories, but doctors and pharmacies, which made up the bulk of the number of those immediate suspension orders. So with that, over the last you know handful of years, on any given year, we may use one or two uh, immediate suspension orders to deal with distributors. Um, when the legislation would pa was passed, uh, it, you know, it did impact how we looked at immediate suspension orders. Um, but as the resilient group that, that the version is, they moved to other tools that we had in the administrative toolbox. So whether it was voluntary surrenders, and you see a lot of those numbers actually went up. So as the ISO numbers went down, you saw other categories used by diversion under our administrative tools or under criminal side move up, if that makes sense to you. It's a, it's a nuanced issue, uh, but I, I don't think that, that this notion that we slowed down uh, is an accurate one. We use different tools. And I think the other piece of that, that that I was concerned about that I saw is the notion that 46 employees had left DEA to go point these vulnerabilities out to the industry. I think, look, is is corporations, whether it's the banks and money laundering expertise, anybody that's being regulated has a compliance issue on their own. And to bring in people that are well educated and understand that, those are the people that I know that have left DEA. I, it's not people that have essentially said, I've learned the tools, I'm going to go out to another place and then sell that for, for you know, the wrong type of purposes. If I can follow up you said that other tools were used. Um, is it because of the legislation that sort of hindered the way you went at it previously? And what other tools were used to go after distributors? Other account? administrative actions like voluntary surrender. So as we shifted from the immediate suspension orders, which means we would go and, and, and take that uh, using that administrative tool, we would ask for the surrender. And there's reasons why people would surrender that as opposed to using the ISO process. I can assure you that although it may have been more challenging, as any kind of legislation or policy sometimes has that effect that we will find other ways to essentially continue to do our job. So I, I want people to understand that we did not stop doing what we were supposed to do at DEA. Um, Deputy Attorney General, uh, I want to follow up on this also. Uh, some, several members of Congress are now calling for a repeal of the Marino Bill, which the chief DEA judge says undermines the DEA's enforcement effort against opioid manufacturers and distributors. Do you think this law should be repealed? Now, I'm very concerned about it. Uh, I learned about that, uh, as many of you did over the weekend. As I said, these orders originate with DEA. And uh, I talked with uh, Acting Administrator Patterson about it. I've talked with the Attorney General about it. We're going to review it. I'm not prepared to answer that question right now. But we are going to look into these issues, uh, as Mr. Patterson mentioned, about what tools DEA has available to it. Uh, and if we conclude that they don't have the appropriate tools, uh, then we'll seek more tools. Yes, sir. What challenges do you face um, without a permanent head of the DEA going after cases like these and tackling the opioid crisis? Also, without a head uh, of the White House Council Drug Policy? You know, what you have to recognize is that uh, we have acting administrators and we have an acting drug czar. Uh, and uh, I can assure you we're being very aggressive about uh, how we approach these cases. I think this case illustrates it. And uh, Director, Acting Administrator Patterson has been in the job, I think, about a week and a half and uh, has probably talked to me on average of every other day. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that and continue to find ways that we can uh, be as proactive as possible uh, to try to address this challenge. As I said, it's a multifaceted challenge. You know, this issue of 
uh, diversion of opioid drugs is obviously on your radar screen because of the publicity this weekend. But what the acting administrator and I have discussed is that if you look at the, the data, what you see is that the increase in the drug overdose deaths is actually driven by the Chinese fentanyl rather than the pharmaceutical drugs. The pharmaceutical drugs are a problem as well, but I think we have to keep it in perspective. We have a number of challenges that we need to deal with, all of which fall under the general rubric of the uh, opioid overdose crisis. You may be aware of this. We have you know, traditional her heroin and opium are plant-based. What we're dealing with here is synthetic. These are chemicals manufactured in labs uh, that raise additional challenges. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, from what you're describing about how chemists in China or anywhere else are able to sort of leapfrog around changes in scheduling law and technicalities mm -hmm. of chemical formulations, this all starts to sound a little bit like whack-a-mole. Um, what, what about this case uh, should anybody believe is going to change fundamentally the structural flow of fentanyl into the U.S. market or uh, the, the overdose crisis that fentanyl plays such a driving role in? I think it's a really important question. You know, this is about two distributors of fentanyl. Uh, there are many others out there, and that's why when we've talked with the Chinese, we're not talking just about their support of particular investigations. We're talking about a broader approach, as I said, scheduling the precursor drugs, which would have a dramatic impact and empower Chinese authorities to shut down all these labs preemptively, not waiting until particular analogs are created and then scheduled, uh, but shutting them down preemptively. So uh, the individual cases, I think, are representative of our commitment. They demonstrate our ability to investigate these cases and reach back and identify the distributors. And one of the points that I've made uh, in all of my meetings with our uh, assistant U.S. attorneys throughout the country is that these are the kind of cases we want them working on. We want them working up the chain when they have an overdose death in their community. You know, don't stop with the immediate local distributor. Find out where those drugs are coming from, how they're getting into the community. Because we can shut down these labs in China. We can save hundreds and maybe thousands of lives. In the back. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah, um, you've uh, placed criminal charges against uh, some of these small or smaller uh, uh, companies, businesses that have been pumping opioids, legal opioids, out in the communities without asking questions. So my question to you is, what's the difference between them and the big distributors? Why aren't any criminal charges? You mentioned civil charges against McKesson and the others. Why are these distributors who have actually fed this opioid addiction crisis without asking questions about the buyers? Why are there no criminal investigations against them? So I think it's a good question. You have to understand the regulatory scheme and the criminal tools that we have. So these criminal charges that we're bringing, for example, against doctors and pharmacists, are predicated on the notion that these folks are giving the drugs directly to people that they know do not have a legitimate medical need for the drugs. Pill mills, for example, you know, doctors who spend all day long writing prescriptions for people who don't need the prescriptions. Pharmacies that are providing drugs to people who obviously have no legitimate need for the drugs. Uh, and so we're able to prove the criminal intent with regard to those offenses. When you're looking upstream at manufacturers of pharmaceutical drugs, there are legitimate uses for those drugs. And so our cases uh, have been predicated on proving that there was some uh, regulatory obligation they had that they didn't comply with. If you look at, for example, the cases I mentioned that we handled in Maryland, these are cases that are initiated by DEA and then referred to the U.S. Attorney's Office, Cardinal Health and McKesson are two examples, where we were able to demonstrate that because of the volume of drugs that were being supplied to particular intermediaries, uh, that uh, it would have been apparent to them that they should have reported it because they were suspicious orders. Uh, and so that's our approach to you know, upstream manufacturers. I'm going to let uh, Administrator Patterson speak to that because he has more responsibility for the administrative side, that is the regulation of the pharmaceutical company. Uh, but generally speaking, that's the challenge we face in, in uh, uh, criminal cases is proving the relevant criminal intent to satisfy the statute. Rob? Uh, are there criminal investigations against any of these companies? Um, I'm going to let Rob uh, answer the first question. And generally, as you know, we don't comment on that. And I won't comment on that. So uh, I, I think his description of the process, the Deputy Attorney General's description of the process for criminal uh, charges on these uh, manufacturers and distributors is accurate. Um, again, we'll use our administrative tools to the extent we can. Uh, in, in pursuing this to provide information to the U.S. Attorney's offices as we move forward on trying to seek criminal charges. Our goal is to obviously hold those accountable that knowingly essentially violate the law. Let's take one last question. Uh, Devil. You've talked about how fentanyl is the new face of this problem. For the last two years, government officials have been talking about a rise in heroin overdose deaths. 
but the data suggests that those, in fact, largely weren't heroin overdose deaths, that those were fentanyl deaths. Do you think the government was slow to recognize the fentanyl problem, and why or why not? And I'm reluctant to ask for the government in general. I can speak to my personal experience. It came to my attention around January 2014 in Maryland uh, that we had a spike in overdose deaths attributable to fentanyl, and we reached out to DEA and we developed a strategy to try to deal with the fentanyl problem in our community. Uh, and I think it's not exclusively fentanyl. There's been an increase in heroin overdose deaths as well. I think that the death rate attributed to prescription drugs, to oxycodone, uh, actually has leveled off somewhat. Uh, but heroin remains a problem. It's not like we solved the heroin problem. My point is simply that the fentanyl uh, problem far outstrips the others. Uh, and the, the increase has been dramatic. If you look just over the last three years, I think we increased from about, I believe it was about 2,500 deaths attributed to fentanyl up to 20,000 over the course of just three years. So that's what's driving this increase in overdose deaths. So my question is, do you think that's because you're now looking for fentanyl when you weren't actually looking for fentanyl? Well, what you have to keep in mind is it's, you know, the question is who's looking. The, the cause of death is actually determined by the local medical examiners, and so we and the federal government are actually, those statistics are derivative of what we're getting from the MEs. So, uh, so I can't vouch for those numbers any more than to tell you that that's the data that we're getting from the medical examiners, but it's consistent with what we're seeing in terms of the interdictions from Customs and Border Patrol and DEA and the Postal Inspection Service. We know there's been an increasing volume uh, of fentanyl coming in through the mail. And we have the same response from our colleagues in Canada. You know, they've been facing the same challenge. So that's a pretty good indication that, uh, you know, that this, this reflects a reality that is there it has been an increase uh, in fentanyl and, uh, and that is driving the overdose death rates. As I said, it's not to in any way diminish the significance of heroin. Heroin has been increasing uh, in, uh, uh, in use as well uh, and oxycodone diversion remains a priority for us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.